being here tonight. Um, we have RJ Rushmore. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background and then um, I won't spend too much time so he can jump right into his lecture. But um, grew up in suburbs of Chicago, went to high school in London, um, college in Philadelphia, and so currently <coughs> he's most known for his work as founder and editor-in-chief of Vandalog. Um, he also works at Mural Arts in Philadelphia, which is the largest mural arts community mural arts organization in the world. Um, he's the author of a couple of books, most recently, Viral Art, How the Internet Has Shaped Street Art and Graffiti. Um, he's also curator of Elemental Gallery in Philadelphia, and he previously worked as a curator for the LISA Project, which stands for Little Italy Street Art. So um, I hope from that introduction you'll get a sense of what tonight's talk is going to be about. So, RJ. Wait, I have this. Oh, yeah. Thanks uh, so much for having me. Uh, thanks, Steve, for uh, and the whole architectural department for, for bringing me out. Uh, this is a required slide. I hope you've all read it and learned about continuing education credits. Um, and I hope I'm not voiding my contract by just going to the next one. And also, there are learning objectives. Let's read them together. Um, hopefully, today, you'll be able to identify ties between street art and digital art, uh, identify digital places that function as public places, uh, insert your own creations into physical and digital space in interesting ways, and identify the difference between additions to public space that contribute to or disrupt the status quo. Um, so, actual presentation. Um, yeah, so as, as Steve mentioned, I recently uh, put out an ebook. It's actually a free download. Uh, it's hundreds of pages, but it is just something I wanted to put out for free. Uh, it's viralart.net is where you can download it. And uh, it was about street art and graffiti and the internet. And what I didn't really get to talk about was the political side of that in the book. So that's why I've kind of put it into this presentation. And I also think that. Uh, even if we're not trying to start a revolution tonight, uh, it's a really interesting way of looking at how effective street art can be. So um, I'm going to talk about how all these things tie together. The spectacle, which I'll get to and explain what the hell that means in just a second. Um, the internet, graffiti, street art, net art, and hacking. And yes, net art is a thing. If you haven't heard of it, it's basically art made for the internet. Maybe it exists as a website, right? Or maybe it's an animated GIF. Or maybe it's something, a piece of art, a performance art piece on Facebook. Uh, those would be all examples of uh, net art. Um, so the spectacle. Um, this is the spectacle. It's a really, really complicated concept uh, that Guy Debord, a, situation, a philosopher, a French philosopher, came up with uh, in like the 50s. Uh, he started this movement called situationalism. Uh, he was a situationist. and. He created. He came up with this concept of the spectacle, which we're kind of looking at. Basically, it is this idea of mass media and mass culture and mass consumption that stupefies us. And if we every day, if this is Times Square in New York, this is a tourist attraction. You go to New York City to look at billboards that tell you to buy, <laughs> right? Um, am I allowed to swear? Yes. yes? Okay. Good. Um, there's going to be a lot of that. Um, so, uh, if and, and this, you know, this is the epitome of it, but it's also just reading the newspaper, right? You read the newspaper in the morning, that means that you're paying, you know, a dollar or whatever to, to buy the newspaper, or you're reading it online, you have your New York Times subscription, and you're contributing to this culture, and you're going home, and you're watching Game of Thrones, and you're not, you're basically not having, as DeBoard would, would argue, you're not, you're not in the middle of a revolution, so that's bad. And it's, and it's all of our entire culture that basically stupefies us into just having a boring day <laughs> um, and telling us to buy more shit and it'll make us less boring. But in reality, it just contributes to our boring, non-revolutionary day. Now, I'm, again, I'm not saying we need to go all start a, you know, a workers' revolution tonight, but it's a, this is a really effective concept for thinking about how street art and graffiti can be effective because DeBoard said we need to disrupt the spectacle. We need to disrupt the everyday. So, he would write. He would actually write graffiti in the 50s, um, like just very simple spray-painted scrawls in Paris, um, little poems, one-sentence poems, or just revolt or whatever. And he would also um, he would plan performances where they would disrupt. If anybody knows like riot, 
going into a Russian church and just playing like a punk song in the middle of this church. The situation is Gitaboard. They invented that concept. This do performance art to disrupt a church proceeding, um, to disrupt the spectacle. So I think asking, does this work disrupt the spectacle, whether or not we're trying to cause a revolution, is a really effective way of gauging whether or not street art or graffiti is any good. <laughs> um, so this is early graffiti. Um, what is graffiti? It's writing your name, right? And uh, it is. And this is a piece. This is a, a photo from the 1970s. Uh, and this was just. This is a New York City subway train. Um, this is sort of a, a definition that I like to use. We all know graffiti is writing your name. Maybe you're using spray paint. Maybe you're using bucket paint. Maybe you're carving it into a window. But this is what graffiti is about, right? There are elements of it that are art. I mean, I find that there's a lot, I probably find a lot more graffiti to be art than, uh, than you guys, just because I've made my life about finding the art in graffiti. But it's also a sport. At its core, it's a sport. And the one who gets their name up the most and in the best places, they win. The problem with that is you have to keep going, right? Because there's no, there's no end game. There's no, oh, OK, that's the fourth quarter. You had your name up the best. Um, so as soon as you stop writing, as soon as you've won, somebody else comes in as the winner. But um, this is, I think, an effective way of looking at graffiti. This is another really useful way to look at graffiti. Um, <coughs> the key here, this is Evan Roth, uh, who's a, a conceptual artist and big fan of graffiti. Sometimes he's a street artist um, and a real pioneer in bridging street art and graffiti and technology. And he's, he's himself kind of a hacker in the sense of like, the kind of people who, I mean, the, you all probably are, that you wish you had 3D printers or you do have 3D printers, like, and you want to mess with things and make new tools out of old tools, right? And he sees graffiti as all about a hack, right? Because let's look at this again, thinking about this as a hack. So <coughs> here we have, does anybody know why this graffiti might be on a subway train in the 1970s? Shout it out if you have an idea. Why? Yeah, why? Yeah, because well. it's moving, so you deliver the name to the most amount of people. Exactly, which gets back to this goal of like the sport of graffiti, right? And that's a hack, because that's, why are you using a subway train? To achieve my goal. This is not what subway trains were designed to do, right? Why spray paint? Because spray paint, you can do things like that star three piece, and it's quick, and it works on metal. Whereas like a Sharpie wouldn't really be effective, but maybe on the inside of the train a Sharpie is effective. Another sort of development here, we can actually see on this train, development of graffiti. This here, this really blurry piece, that's star three. That's also star three. Did anyone here notice that star three piece before I pointed it out? You're all probably looking at that star three piece, because that's the biggest piece on the train, right? And that guy, basically, like that's an evolution of graffiti. That's him saying, well, I could have done this with markers or maybe with some bucket paint or a small brush, but oh, if I reuse two colors of spray paint and I, I can win better, right? I can win more than all these guys. I can win more than Chico, who has his name up five times on this train, but it's really small. Um, and so graffiti is all about this idea of, of hacking the materials you're using and the things you're putting your name on. Um, it's, I mean, really graffiti is, is about hacking the environment uh, that hacking the systems that are available to you to achieve the goals of graffiti. Um, this is a more recent example. Um, Katsu and Reader, who Reader, have, I'm told, has a few pieces in Detroit, but not a lot. Katsu does have a fair bit. I've been wandering around today, uh, and I've seen a lot of Katsu work. Um, so the Katsu and Reader are the pieces in black here that, you know, they're half buffed, they're half covered. But at the same time, if I tell you, that's Katsu, that's Reader, you can probably identify, oh yeah, I guess that would read, okay, Katsu, and then it, okay. Um, so if you're already aware that those are names, then those are still readable to you, right? Um, and does anybody know how they did that? Yeah. Fire yeah. extinguisher, tap on the water, tap on the paint. Yes. <laughs> so fire extinguisher graffiti, one of the best innovations in graffiti in like the last decade or two. Um, I think it's awesome. So. Why did they do that, right? Because you can't ride on trains anymore in New York City because if you ride on a train, it will be gone. It will run once. It will run to the train yard and then it will be buffed because you can't, you know, New York City has said we will not allow graffiti to be on trains. So, you know, there's no point in riding on trains. So you ride on walls. This is actually a wall next to a train track, right? And <coughs> the, on the bottom you have this gray paint. 
Now, that's, that's the buff. That's the graffiti removal guy coming along. So all these guys who have done work, and great, they've put up their name and they've done their thing. It's with spray paint and it's effective and maybe they use some colors to make it brighter and more visible. Um, but all that could be gone tomorrow. That's like, okay, that guy comes in the afternoon, one o'clock, by two o'clock, all those names are gone. But they're not gonna buff Katsu and Reader because it's just not efficient. <laughs> you know, if you're the buff man, you don't want to get the super extendo pole. You know, that's, that's hard work. Using a paint roller that extends that high, it is physically difficult work if you've ever tried to do it. And he could just easily just buff that part, you know? <clears throat> it's not worth his time or money or anyone's time or money to remove that work. So that's why, you know, Katsu and Reader are, again, hacking the system that they've been given. They, they have a new system. They can't write on the trains. They can write on walls. Shit, there's a buff man. What do we do? We, we acknowledge the buff man and we evolve. We use fire extinguishers to paint really big so the buff man can't touch it. So again, graffiti and hacking in a more contemporary sense. Um, now the spectacle. Remember, back to that. Um, so this is just a, you know, a train in, uh, I think it's in Berlin, uh, covered in graffiti. Now if you're reading the newspaper, or just on your phone playing Angry Birds or whatever, and this train rolls up when you're trying to get to work or go to school, that's like a holy shit moment, right? That, that's a moment where you're looking up and you're like, oh my god, how did, that, how did that kid get on the front of the train? You know, how did he sneak into the train yard, do that? How did all of his friends clearly have hit the rest of this train with whatever we can't see yet? And I mean, it's just a holy shit moment. There's no other way to describe that, right? And it's also a moment that hopefully, potentially, makes you question, like, OK, that's the state's property. What right did these guys have to do it? Oh, they did it anyway. Why the hell would they do that anyways? Why would they claim that space? Could I claim that space? Right? And all these thoughts are going through your head, hopefully. Or maybe you just think it's ugly and fuck those guys. Or you think, oh my god, it's beautiful, and that's it. But either way, whatever your reaction, you're disrupted. You're out of the spectacle for half a second and your day is changed, your mind is someplace other than where, I mean, again, to just go back to super left-wing ideology, debord ideology, it's somewhere other than where capitalism <laughs> wants you to be. Um, and I think that is a, a sign that graffiti is like effective, right? That's, that's an effective piece of graffiti. Whereas a small tag that no one else notices maybe isn't as effective because it's not really disrupting, it's not disruptive in the same way, right? Um, it might be still getting your name up, but it gets you no more, you know, again, going back to that idea of the sport, a small little tag on the inside of that train doesn't get you as many points, per se, as that does, because that's more disruptive. Um, but how does street art fit into this, right? Now, street art is this whole other thing, and I'll, I'll show my definition later, but essentially street art is, um, you know, art on the street that's not graffiti, right? It's how we generally think of it. So how does something like this uh, Stickman, who's an East Coast-based uh, amazing street artist. He, this is a piece, these are my feet, this is asphalt, and this is Stickman. How does that relate to like disruption, right? I would say, I've had people come up to me and ask me, who know nothing about street art, but just who know, oh, you know about street art? Hey, I, I know this thing, there's like a robot on, like outside of my house on the ground, and I walk by it every day. What, what is that robot? I love it. It makes me smile every day. It makes me stop and like think about stuff. It's like my meditation space, or it's like I'm in the middle of this crowded city and I know where that robot is. Or I walk the different route to school or to work to go see the little robot on the ground or on the wall, the little stick man. I'm like, oh yeah, that's stick man, he's awesome. Look, he hearts you, right? Like to me that is disruptive in a different way, but it's also very disruptive um, to the spectacle because you're saying why the hell is this guy risking his freedom, spending his money, to say that you're awesome, right? Or just to give you a space and put up his, his, his little logo and make that guy your friend. Um, I mean, really, that's when I see those pieces. Um, even long before now, I, like, I'm friends with Stickman and stuff, but long before I ever knew him, knew anything about him, I was like, I feel like I'm your friend, man, because like, you give me these gifts all the time. Um, and then that's disruptive, too. Um, here's a little more obvious version. This actually uses, this got by a guy called Poster Boy. And it uses a method called determinant, which uh, Guy Debord, the original situationist who came up with the idea of the spectacle, uh, pioneered and, and really uh, loved. So <laughs> the idea is to take the tools of capitalism, take the tools of the state, and turn them and parody them and use them against them itself, right? 
use the tools of capitalism against capitalism or the state. In this case, this came out, Poster Boy did this piece right after uh, all of Edward Snowden's revelations start coming out, and we know that Verizon is giving all of our phone records to the government, right? So he went into a New York City subway station with a razor blade. This is his methodology. He goes in with a razor blade and cuts up these ads that are all vinyl. I mean, they're giant stickers, right? They're giant vinyl stickers. So if you go in here and cut that segment out, you got a sticker. Peel it off. Put it somewhere else. <laughs> And he reorganizes the series of ads, takes an ad from, I think that's like Despicable Me, right? That little eye thing. Takes a Despicable Me ad from over here, puts it on here, messes with the words, and turns it into this great message, anti-Verizon message. So again, that's a disruption, right? You're on the subway, and you're like, maybe you look, we all like to say we don't look at the ads, but we do. They're effective. That's why we buy <laughs> right? Like, I'm sorry, I'm not ashamed to admit that when I needed insurance, I called Geico, because <laughs> I hear a lot of Geico ads. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a bad person, I guess. Uh, but uh, we see these ads, and we generally ignore them. That's disruptive, because when you see that ad, you can't ignore it, and it snaps you out of, you're like, why the f would Verizon put that up? Oh my god, Verizon didn't put that up. Some guy messed with this ad. Can I mess with this ad? Right? So again, I mean, it is like disrupting the spectacle in the most obvious, intense way, and I think that's a really effective piece of street art. And it's really what street art is supposed to do in many ways. If you talk about, if you ask people, why do you love street art? They say, it's because I turned a corner one day and I saw something and it made me go, holy crap. And that's something that if I saw it, I got off the train and I saw it, I go, holy crap, right? And disruptive stuff is what makes you do that. Um, here's a problem, normalization or co-optation. So eventually, we also, street art's really popular, right? Like who here has seen Exit Through the Gift Shop? Right, like half this room has seen a movie that was an Oscar-nominated movie about street art, and basically about how street art is really popular. Right, it's it's a popular movie all about street art. This is a mural that I actually helped organize. There's a couple works by this artist Tristan Eaton in Detroit. I actually saw one today. Um, I love Tristan. I love his work. I love this mural. I wouldn't have put my own time and energy and money into this mural if I didn't love it. But let's face it, this mural is not disruptive. This mural is in Little Italy in New York, in the heart of a place that is trying to no longer be considered a tourist trap. <laughs> and, um, and they asked us to put murals, and they asked me and some friends to like organize murals in that neighborhood. Why? Not because they wanted to disrupt people's daily commute, but because they wanted New Yorkers to come back to Little Italy. They wanted people to come and see this and take photos and say, I like being in Little Italy. They wanted to support Little Italy, right? And, and, and to support like the capitalist notions of Little Italy. Um, so this is not disruptive. This is just, to, you know, I, as much as I love this, as far as disruption goes, this is no different from that sign that's advertising you going to Cha Cha's restaurant, right? Um, and that's what street art has become. Street art has become this way for Cha Cha to sell coffee and pizza. And Maybe that's really awesome. I mean, I work for a public art program in Philadelphia, and I love the fact that I know that when we put up a mural, it's an economic driver in that neighborhood, and it's a hugely positive contribution in neighborhoods that are distressed. I also know that it's not disruptive in the same way that a poster boy piece or a stick man piece is, and you have to think about it differently. So I actually wouldn't consider this to be street art. I would consider this to be muralism done by a street artist, right? Here's another example. Beautiful mural by Swoon who's actually an artist really influenced by the Situationist. I'm sorry, it's kind of a <laughs> photo. This is at Bowery and Houston in New York City. It's an um, intersection right downtown, right um, across from the Tumblr World headquarters and the big Whole Foods. And uh, this is a mural that she did a year after Sandy to sort of celebrate uh, the recovery of the city. It was a community mural. It had uh, various collaborators on it. It had kids helping out. Like Everything about that is so awesome to me. But let's also face facts. She is a street artist who's influenced by situationist thought and influenced in the idea of wanting to disrupt the spectacle. Well, here's a problem with that wall. This is the whole wall. There's an element of control here. That wall was done by, was, is organized by Goldman Properties, the property owners. And they put lights on it and security cameras. And you can paint in that section if you're invited to paint because they think that you being there will raise property values. You cannot paint in all of this red area of that building, even though that's still Goldman Properties. No, that's a no-no, because that would not contribute to raising their property values for whatever reason. When uh, 
I'm going to call him Pixodi, even though I know that's not the correct pronunciation for his name because I can't speak Portuguese. When Pixodi did a piece here that's kind of half removed, it's a, it was a piece with a, a paint roller, right? So it's what we call a roller. Um, piece of graffiti, just his name and the little asterisks. And um, the guy up there, that's not the graffiti writer. That's the buff man removing it. Um, so he's then going up like two days later. This piece lasted maybe one or two days. And there's a guy going up and buffing it out, removing it. So the property owners are only happy with quote unquote street art or muralism when it can be used to raise their property values, not when it's legitimately disruptive like that piece. And they are not OK with disruption. So there's got to be a difference, but we have to acknowledge there's a difference between street art and graffiti that's disruptive and this other stuff that's not, right? Um, and that's kind of important because, again, there's those holy <laughs> moments. And the idea that street art is supposed to be about freedom, graffiti is about freedom, right? So that's kind of a problem. And we'll get back to how we can solve this problem in just a second. Um, the internet exists. We all know this, right? Internet, yay. Um, so when the internet started happening, existing, whatever, <laughs> um, uh, obviously art is getting shared there. And um, art was being shared on blogs for years. I was you know, very big on Flickr. Now everything's kind of moved to Instagram. There are photographers. I mean, there's, I know there's one photographer in this room who spends you know, his lunch breaks running around Detroit taking photos of graffiti. Like, that's, that's the hobby, right? And there are many people in Detroit who do this, many people in Philly who do this, in New York, in any city around the world, there are going to be people who do this now. And they're going to post it to Instagram, and then there are going to be Instagram accounts that, amount, that sort of take all the best of those photos, and they have a million followers just reposting other people's cool photos of murals and graffiti and whatever. Um, problem is, you get pieces like this, which again, I, this is an artist I've worked with, I respect, but I, I acknowledge there's an element of this piece that was made to go viral. That was just, that is an internet friendly piece. Oh my God, it's a heart, there's little bones inside of it. It's done with spray paint, which is like extra double points, right? Like street art with a heart, yeah, go viral. <laughs> um, so that's kind of a problem. Um, sorry, I'll get back to the problem. This is a good way to think about the internet, right? There were 600 miles of track in New York City for people to paint on trains. Now there's a global track. We can communicate with one another, and space is infinite. And we can get up, just as a graffiti writer would get up on a train, you can get up on the internet. And that's why things like Shock One, that's him getting up on the internet, because um, he knows people are going to share that photo. And this is a quote from a, a graffiti writer who used to paint trains in New York. Um, so better example, I think, of street art for the internet. This is a piece by Olek. Now, that Shock One piece I showed you, that's still there. I, I photographed that piece in London, I don't know, a year ago, and I, have, I know it's still there. Um, and, it, and it wasn't new when I photographed it. But, uh, so it at least could be enjoyed by someone on the street, right? But what about this piece? This is the Astro Place Cube um, in New York City. And it's a really cool sculpture. If anybody's seen it, you can actually push this cube, and it rotates, and it's giant and awesome. Um, this is Olek. It doesn't normally have this camo pattern on it. Olek is a crochet knit artist um, who crocheted this pattern and then put it on the cube at like 5, 6 in the morning one day and then just start taking photos and video. By 7, 8 in the morning, that was gone. Somebody came up, security guy comes up, snip, 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 take that away. No, can't have that. Do you think Olek really thought that that piece was going to stay there forever? No, it's, it was, you know, it was meant to last an hour, maybe 10 hours. Maybe it gets to the end of the business day before somebody finally says, yo, we got to snip this thing off. And that's fine, because Olek had photos and video. And the you know, 100 or so people who saw it also took photos and video and said, oh my god, this is cool. And now it's gone. And by the time it was gone, like, it was on Gawker. It was on the New York Times. It was in the Washington Post. It was around the world. People are talking about, oh my god, this crazy artist covered the Astro Place cube in pink camouflage. So it didn't matter that that piece only lasted an hour, because it was designed to be seen and experienced on the internet. It's really, it's, it's, in some sense, it's conceptual, right? It's, oh my god, wouldn't it be cool if someone did that to the Astro Place cube? Oh my god, they did. It really doesn't matter that you can't see it anymore, because you can see the pictures, and the idea is cool. Um, this is another example of street art for the internet. Um, and this is by Sever. This is a piece that was actually in Detroit. Um, and uh, 
it's basically an editorial cartoon. Um, I really like, again, I like Sever's work. I've worked with Olek. I like her work. Um, so if I'm being somewhat critical of it and trying to pull some layers away, it's not because I don't like the work. I think this piece is great. I also don't think this piece was intended for anyone on the street to actually see it. Um, it only lasted a couple of weeks. That doesn't really matter. It could still be there today. It's still not intended for that audience. Because who, can anyone here identify, these are um, six characters. Can anybody identify um, one of the characters on there? Okay, how many people? Okay, good, good number of you can identify one character on this thing. Who can identify two characters? Okay, a little less. Uh, three characters? Can anybody identify all six characters other than Steve? Because um, he saw this presentation yesterday. So if he couldn't, it, can, can he identify all six characters? <laughs> um, you got five? Okay, we got somebody who has five. That's good. <laughs> um, and actually, this is your photo. So thank you. <laughs> Still your photo. That is Futura. Um, there you go. It's appointment, Futura appointment. So these five figures, six, six figures, are um, basically icons of street art and graffiti, right? We have Obey, uh, Shepherd Fairy's Obey giant face up in the top, uh, on the top left, um, who Shepherd Fairy did the Obama Hope poster. He has Obey clothing, you know, big name. He's done, you know, covers for Time Magazine and Rolling Stone a dozen times. We have us Gemios here. Again, these are all just their distinctive sort of almost logos, if you will, their distinctive characters. Us Gemios with this yellow head with the fuzzy hair, um, Brazilian twins. So Shepard Ferry from LA, Brazilian twins from Sao Paulo, Barry McGee from San Francisco uh, with straight up, this is a piece that he would have done in the mid 90s, this, this head character. So pulling back into history here, uh, Banksy from Bristol with the gorilla, Futura, uh, doing a really a, I mean, a, a style, I guess he's been doing it for about 20 years, this point man character. So Futura, an old train writer though, from, from uh, a graffiti writer from the, is the 70s, 80s in New York. And Cause here, uh, who designed the MTV Moon Man sculpture, the, the new one that they released about two years ago, and has a or had a clothing line, has done the bottle design for Hennessy. Um, actually, yes, Jimmy O. Shepard and Cause have all done bottle designs for Hennessy. Um, so these are the icons of street art and graffiti, right? But only a handful of people can even identify five or six of them. So clearly this wasn't intended for the person who's walking down the street. This was intended for Sever to take a photo of it, post it on Instagram or Facebook, and go, hey guys, I made this like editorial cartoon. This could have been on Canvas. This was for the internet to see. Because on the internet, there are thousands of people who could identify five or six of these people and get what he was going for with this carrying the coffin of street art image. No one, into, you know, no one, no one walking by it, very few people walking by it were going to get that. Um, so I would say that's like street art for the internet. So why the hell is he painting it on a wall and not on canvas? That, I'm, I, that actually really frustrates me, I got to say. Like, it's not disruptive in the same way, because I don't know what the f that means. So it's not disruptive if I'm walking by. And I just took up a bunch of wall space that could have been uh, used by a really disruptive or interesting mural, or even a non-disruptive mural, that at least makes sense to me, <laughs> right? Um, so I want to show you this video by Katsu. Um, change it up a little bit. Um, this is a video, as you can see, has about 100,000 views. Um, Katsu is a graffiti writer. Again, we, we saw Katsu stuff earlier. Um, so there's the White House. And oh, there's Katsu. There was audio for this, but I guess it's not. Anyways. Um, so, um, oh my god, Katsu tagged outside of the White House. Now imagine me as a graffiti street art blogger seeing this piece, right? I'm immediately going to see that. I'm going to post it to Twitter, post it to Facebook, post it to my blog. Oh my god, you guys, Katsu tagged the fucking White House. And then to tell people, like, because then I want people to come to my blog to see that video, because they could see it anywhere. So I got to post it now. Here's the problem, though. Um, let's watch that video again. That's all done in After Effects. He did not tag the White House. That's just, that's just video effects, which if you look closely, you can see. You can figure that out. You're like, why the hell is it jiggling a little bit? Why, is the, you know, why are the letters jiggling on the wall? That makes no sense. Why is his spray can? like blurred out, makes no sense. It's because it was all special effects. He didn't actually tag the White House, 
but 100,000 people watched a video of his name going up outside the White House. So again, I would say that would be hacking a system that that's, that's graffitiing the internet, right? This is not street art or graffiti for the internet. That's graffitiing the internet. Um, convincing 100,000 people to at least, even if they know it's fake, watch the video. Um, by now, though, I've probably shown this video about 1,000 times. So let's say 114,000 views. Um, so, uh, is my next slide also? Okay, so, and I think this speaks to that, the, this quote really speaks to where I see like Katsu being really smart and Sever with that particular piece not being very smart, right? If you're gonna be doing, you know, visual art is gonna be on the internet and just like your articles on BuzzFeed know how to reach an audience, street art and graffiti on the internet should know how to reach an audience and should be designed so that it can reach an audience. Just as an initial graffiti was designed to reach an audience by being put on a subway train. Let's design our graffiti to reach an audience. And that's what Katsu did that Sever arguably did not do, um, even if it was cool and went viral anyways. So if people are finding their street art online and they're walking around looking at their phones instead of what's around them, I know I do this, I've run into polls like a dozen times. I'm, not, I'm a little ashamed to say it, but I will. Um, then why should we paint on the streets? John Fechner did this piece. John's a stencil artist from, started in about 1978 in New York City, and he's still active today. Except that he'll do maybe one mural outdoors a year, maybe one illegal stencil piece, and then he'll make digital art all day long and post it to Tumblr and Flickr and Vine. He was probably one of the first video artists active on Vine, and he's like, you know, this is a, re a retired professor. Um, and so he is, thinking about how the street and the internet are similar and how they're both public spaces, right? Why do we need to paint on the street? He can stay in his house and do the same thing he was doing. It's, so it's the same idea, like why would you paint on your house when you could paint on a subway? Well, why would you paint on a subway when you can paint on the, paint on the internet, right? Because you're gonna reach a lot more people making digital art. As long as you make that ap digital art appealing and compelling, you're gonna reach a lot more people than if you paint on a wall outside your house, just like you would in 70s and 80s and why you paint on trains. Um, so that's what I call organic viral art. It's kind of a cheesy title, I, I know. It's basically just viral art. It's just, sorry, it's viral content that is also art. It's shared on people's Facebooks and Tumblrs and Twitters. And you're kind of, even if you're not expecting to see that specific sever piece, you know, you're following your friend on Instagram who sometimes posts graffiti. You're expecting at some point today you might see some graffiti. So it's not, really solving the issue that street art isn't disrupting the spectacle anymore. Because it's not disruptive to see something you're expecting to see, even if you don't know exactly what that thing is. Just as billboards are not disruptive because we know it's a billboard. Okay, moving on, even if it's a different design from yesterday's billboard. Um, so Katsu and Fechner are working within the system that's been set up for them, um, but there's more, right? Um, if graffiti is a series of hacks, and writers want to reach the public, why not hack the internet? Um, I swear to God I'm not crazy about this, at least. Um, so this is my favorite definition of street art. Uh, it's from a guy who totally disagrees with me. He's like a good friend of mine, but he totally disagrees with me about everything I'm saying tonight, which is why I like to use his definition. Um, so if street art is the unmediated distribution of art from artist to public, then why not, like, why mediate it by putting it on a wall and then having to photograph it and then putting it on your Twitter and Instagram and hoping someone sees it? Just put it in front of their faces, right? Just like graffiti. So again, I love this quote from Katsu, um, and I won't read the whole thing, but the core of it is here. He wants to tag the Google homepage. He just wants to put his name up there because that's, that's better than, he could do a thousand tags all around Detroit and New York City and any city in the world, and people might know his name but a hell of a lot more people would know his name if he had the Google homepage for half a second, right? If he was the Google Doodle for a second. And then I also like the end part here. Hackers and graffiti taggers are very similar in the way they think. So again, here's a graffiti writer, not just a critic like me or like Evan Roth, who is also an artist, but really is a critic, um, saying that hackers and graffiti writers are similar. This is one of the best graffiti writers, one of the most traditional graffiti writers of the day, saying, no, these people are similar. Graffiti writers are also hackers. Um, so I would say your phone is in real life, right? This is a piece of art on Instagram. Um, 
that I think functions much like graffiti or street art. Uh, it's by Matt Troy, who's an artist, uh, he's a Canadian artist, I believe he's out of Toronto. And um, I've never met Matt. I have no, like, I've never seen his work in a gallery, nothing like that. He's a young guy, I don't think he's much older than any of us, and he got my attention because I saw his work on somebody else's photo on Instagram that I followed. This is one, Anton, uh, Anthony Anton Ellis. If I was following Antho, uh, Anthony Anton Ellis, I would see this Matt Troy comment of ASCII art, right? And this thing, the way Matt would do these comments is they would go on for pages. Like you'd scroll, 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 and then finally, you know, you get past it to the next thing. You could not miss them. It wasn't just one guy writing an emoji. Um, and it was actually, they were so big that they would freeze up your phone. So you, you'd be, your, physic, your actions would physically be disruptive because you'd be trying to scroll past his comment and your phone would freeze up on you just trying to load the damn thing. Um, so to me, I find this very disruptive. Now you can't do this on Instagram anymore because the system has changed. He was hacking the system here. He was doing graffiti, basically, on Anthony's Instagram account. But the system changed because Instagram saw that spammers, I believe this is what happened, Instagram saw spammers using the same technique, and then they changed it so that you only see the first like three lines of a really long comment, right? So now, this doesn't work anymore. This is like, oh, the buff man has been invented, or trains will always be cleaned, so I can't paint on trains anymore. Okay, got to have more innovations. Um, this is what I call invasive viral art, where, whereas the last was organic, right? It's spreading organically from people sharing it. This is Matt invading your space. Um, and this is what I would consider to be digital street art or digital graffiti. Um, and I would say this is a really great disruption of the spectacle in digital space. This piece actually is more organic viral art, but I've thrown it in this section anyways. Um, Saber, a graffiti writer, right? Hardcore LA graffiti writer, also a very active Twitter user who at the time of this probably had 10,000 followers. Um, he tweeted this ASCII, upside down flag, uh, at the time of the GOP government, or the time of the government shutdown when the GOP was like arguably to blame. In his mind, GOP is to blame for the government shutdown. So he hashtags it, government shutdown, GOP fail, and Fox News. Now, okay, GOP shutdown and GOP fail, I'm sure that those hashtags were all a bunch of negative comments, right, about the shutdown and saying, oh, fuck you, you know, GOP, fuck you, Republicans. But Fox News, that was probably Bill O'Reilly at the time, Glenn Beck, Megyn Kelly, blah, 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 all these tweets. And I bet Fox News likes it that way. Fox News may not technically own the space of that hashtag, but you bet, you know, you bet your ass that they are watching that hashtag and hoping that there are positive things about Fox News being represented there, right? So when Sabre tweets this and it gets 15 retweets, guess what? When you search the Fox News hashtag, that pops right to the top. And it's an upside down flag that says, screw you, Fox News. So to me, that is a form of digital graffiti and it's also very disruptive. It's disruptive of like Fox News's domain. So I would say that's like a digital disruption in, in the spectacle because the spectacle certainly extends online. Um, another similar example of this that I really love. Again, this doesn't work anymore because Facebook has changed their uh, mechanics of how their pages work. This was done um, was it four or five years ago now when Jon Stewart and uh, Stephen Colbert had that rally in DC, the rally to restore sanity and the rally to keep fear alive, right? And so Colbert's slogan, keep fear alive for this rally, on Sarah Palin's Facebook page. Each of these little comments is positive. Yay, Sarah, yay, Sarah, you're awesome. I love your book, whatever. So the censors who are looking at Sarah Palin's comments to try and delete anything, any screw you Sarah Palin's, wouldn't see that, because they would just say, yay, Sarah, I read your book. But then all these commenters, all these, you know, whatever is 15 different people, change their profile pictures. They figure out what order are we, if we all comment at the same second, we're all gonna be right in that little group. Oh great, we're in this comment, you know, Dan, you're first, then John, then Amy, whatever. Okay, and then they change their profile pictures to spell out, keep fear alive, in a way that Sarah Palin's censors are not gonna see right away, but you or me, if we weren't to her page, we would see that right away. That's exactly, what is your eye drawn to on this page? It's not Sarah Palin's name or her picture even, it's keep fear alive. So that was called letter bombing. It was a guy called Jeff Greenspan came up with that. He later went to work for Facebook. So um, yeah, <laughs>
good for him. I would say that's a really great digital disruption in the spectacle. Um, this can also happen in video games. Basically, you can see uh, on the screen, they're saying, please don't shoot me, right? Well, that doesn't, they keep saying, please don't shoot me, or this is an art piece, or I'm making an art performance, except that guy's stabbing him, right? Um, so they're trying to say, why are we killing each other? Um, and at the same time that they're saying, why, why are we killing each other in this game? I'm just an artist. Why would you shoot this artist? Why would you stab this artist? They're in this first-person shooter game. Everyone else is multiplayer online where you know, they're around the world. And everyone else is just saying, like, fuck you. I'm trying to shoot people. I'm playing a game. right? They don't want to think about war. They don't want to think about peace. They just want to play a game. And these guys are in here saying, hey, guys, let's think about what we're doing for a second. We're playing terrorist versus soldier. and like." Why don't we play Peacemaker, right? Why are we killing people who are saying don't be killed? And um, so to me, this is basically like going into a public park and doing a piece of performance art without asking, except that this is a public park online, and it's a video game, and people are really pissed. <laughs> um, so to me, there's a, there's a similarity there between, uh, I mean, I would say that's like invasive viral art. That's very similar to street art or graffiti. It's disruptive. And it's in this, um, it, but it's in a digital public space rather than a physical public space. But what's the difference between that and let's say, you guys know what LARPing is? What's the difference between going to like a LARPing game and saying, please don't kill me, and what these guys are doing, right? Um, oh, yeah, and okay, so what is Evan Roth? Is anybody familiar with the artist Evan Roth? Yeah? How would you oh, describe? Like, yeah, exactly. How would you describe Evan? Okay, any other words you guys would, be, would use? Well, here's how I would describe Evan Roth. I would say that he is a bad <laughs> mother <laughs> because when you Google bad <laughs> his is the top result. His website is <laughs> So he will never lose that. This is what's called a Google bomb, um, which in Evan's case, you know, we can argue, is that really disruptive? Like, it's, it's kind of fun and silly. Um, he'll never lose this, though, because basically he manipulated Google into, you know, he made people, he made everyone, all of his friends, put up a blog post on their blogs and tweeted and posted to Facebook and said, Evan Roth is a bad <laughs> link to Evan's website. Suddenly, the top Google result becomes Evan Roth. Now, every article, every time the New York Times writes about Evan, it says, Evan Roth, who, by the way, if you Google him, or if you Google bad ass, that's Evan Roth, like, which is just re further reinforcing his place in the number one slot on Google for that phrase. Now, in Evan's case, whatever, that's, it's, it's meaningless, right? It's just it's a fun little silly trick, slightly disruptive, because maybe you were looking for Samuel L. Jackson or something. Um, but what if, uh, instead of that, you typed Santorum, because you were looking for Rick Santorum. Um, I don't want to explain what the new meaning of the word Santorum, but it was a Google bomb. Uh, oh, wait, it's up there. It's, it's on the screen. Great. If anybody can read the screen, they can see the definition of Santorum. Um, basically, the sex columnist Dan Savage said, hey, guys, let's, let's, let's make Rick Santorum a Philadelphia politician who's really anti-gay, really uncomfortable by naming a byproduct of um, gay se uh, anal sex uh, after him because it will make him really uncomfortable. Um, so they did, and now when you Google Santorum, that's what comes up before his own name and website. Um, so that's a really effective disruption, right, in this digital space. Because again, Santorum probably thinks, Rick Santorum probably thinks, I have some sort of ownership over my name. Turns out you don't. Turns out Dan Savage owns your name. <laughs> um, so. I'm not going to, there's only a couple slides left, so I'm not going to go scroll through all of those again. So why does viral art matter? Um, well, I think that to disrupt the spectacle, you have to go to where the spectacle is. And when in real life, can also mean on your phone, street art on the street doesn't really disrupt the spectacle in the same way anymore. Viral art keeps the spirit and definition of street art alive. Um, that's the future that I see for street art and graffiti. Um, and you know it's Katsu on the Google homepage because I know that 
this maybe sounds crazy, and there are street artists who like get really mad at me when I when I give this talk and when I say things like this. But at the same time, people like Evan Roth and Katsu um, and John Fechner and Saber are all going from street art and graffiti and moving that and applying the exact same methods or the, the exact same the different methods, different tools, exact same impetus in digital space. And so I think we need to start thinking about how street art and graffiti, the, the ideas of street art and graffiti can be translated to digital space. And those are just a handful of examples. And go out and try it sometime, I guess. I can say that. I'm not a professor here. <laughs> um, so uh, thanks for your time. And yeah, any, any questions or? Yeah? How much do you think the fear of getting caught fuels these uh, disruptive artists to pursue their work? I think it adds a big effect. In, 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 in terms, terms of, of going, going digital, digital versus? No, just even in the streets, like tagging. Oh, yeah. have that fear of, you know. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that's a big inspiration? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it, I think it depends on the artist, right? You know, some artists totally get off on that. Some artists are like, I want to do things that might get me arrested, and I don't care if I get arrested, right? And other artists will do what they, other artists will say, I've been to jail. I will do everything I can to be disruptive and do street art and graffiti that is not technically illegal. And they actually love that idea of just twisting it a little bit. Like there's a guy, Ellis Gallagher, um, who actually is currently, he's in a hospital bed in New York recovering from a stroke. So. If you're going to you know, buy some art this Christmas, I urge you to support him. Um, so Ellis um, da, was a graffiti writer and doesn't do that anymore because he was, didn't want to get arrested. He has a kid, all this stuff. So he uses chalk. And he basically use, does chalk outlines of shadows. So if there's like a bike on the street, he'll like go at night and do a chalk outline of a shadow. And then the next day, maybe the bike is gone, maybe it's there, but certainly the light is different. And the shadow's not there, but it's saved in chalk, right? And so Ellis uses chalk because he wants to do street art or graffiti without getting arrested. Yeah? How do you link up on the timeline of um, graffiti art and like hip hop? Like, how, does, how did that go hand in hand? And how does that get into the emergence of hip hop? I'm going to get in trouble for saying this. Um, a lot of graffiti writers, early graffiti writers, had no interest in the other elements of hip hop. A lot of early graffiti writers listened to Led Zeppelin. Other early graffiti writers were also b-boys and also rappers and DJs, right? And it was only when a handful of guys who were sort of either promoting themselves or promoting what they saw to be the culture sort of started saying, oh yeah, I'm a graffiti writer, I'm also a b-boy, also my friend raps, and oh my god, the Village Voice is listening to me. Let me talk about all the cool things my friends do. That that started coming together. Or a good example of this sort of traveling around the world. There's no natural reason why um, if you're hearing rap for the first time in Los Angeles, you should also pick up a spray can. Because for every rap line that's about picking up a spray can, there were a million other things like go to a bar and get a chick and do whatever and have fun and have a block party, right? So if you're in LA, why would you pick up a spray can because you rap, or because you b-boy, right? Or because you are a b-boy or b-girl, right? It would be because of a movie called Wild Style, and, argue, and to a lesser degree, Style Wars. Wild Style was a, is a fictional movie done by Charlie Ahern that stars graffiti writers, b-boys, b-girls, um, rappers, DJs, and just took all those elements of hip hop and threw them into one film. And it's a, in some senses, it's a really authentic film. It's actually starring those the people who are participating in that culture. In another sense, that was Fab Five Freddy telling Charlie Ahern, all these people are connected, I swear, I swear they're connected, Charlie, come on. And maybe Lee, Lee, who's the star of that film, I don't know if Lee like also, li also listens to rap. I have no idea. If anybody knows if Lee raps, tell me. I know Lee, and he likes rap. OK, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know him, too, my friend's husband. <laughs> So, okay, so, Lee, so that's good. I mean, like, I love Wild Style. I love Freddie. Like, I love Charlie Ahern, who's the director of that movie. But let's face it, if you're in Berlin and you see Wild Style, you're going to start doing all of those things. Whereas, if you just got Rapper's Delight on you know, a record and you're in Berlin, there's no reason for you to also start picking up a spray can. So I, I, I contribute a lot of that to Wild Style, um, which I know is going to get me in trouble. <laughs> Uh, 
any other questions? Yeah? Uh, some of the intern examples that you gave, like the video game one and the comment one, seem pretty close to like trolling. Yes. Uh, do you think that those are related in any way, or is like trolling normalizing uh, the effects of this internet graffiti stuff? That's a really interesting question. I never, I never thought about that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think like trolling is a, is a little different, or like making memes, let's say. Like making memes, you could say, trolling memes or not, would be like organic viral art, right? But those people aren't necessarily considering that to be art. So I would say, there. but some people who make memes are, or some trolls do consider their work to be like an art in some sense. So I would compare it to tagging. There are tags that I love. There are tags that I know that are totally, absolutely art. And then there are tags that like, I don't know, my friend did because he was drunk one night and he wasn't trying to make it art. He was just writing Bob on a wall, right? And so I would say that the trolls are like the guys who are just drunk writing Bob on a wall. So it's more like a text. Yeah, yeah, yeah I would, I, you know, it's, again, I, this is not something I put a lot of thought into, but off the top of my head, that's sort of where I would, the comparison I would make. Yeah? While well, you've been in town, have you gone to Hamtramck? Uh, uh, no, no, I haven't. Okay. Have you seen the subtle piece that you thought was not disruptive um, with the caskets? Yeah, the caskets and the um, and the street art from the dead? No, no I, I, I thought, thought it was gone. gone. That's fine. Well, it is gone, so that's my point. You, my point is that it, it was a very disruptive piece mm -hmm. for the community, and on multiple levels, I'm sure the artist wasn't even aware of. It was disruptive between street artists, muralists, the ethnic community there. Um, I don't think that artists could have ever known what, <laughs> what, what was about to happen with that piece, and that is why that piece does not exist any longer, because there was such a, lots of meetings happened, lots of lots of voices got into this argument, and it was eventually covered by a local artist who was trying to, you know, quell, quell the anger and the destruction about that piece. So what that artist thought was, you know, would you have found that successful? Maybe not. Was it disruptive? <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. I, I, not necessarily in a positive way that you look here. You, you watch you read, the, the visceral reactions from some of the people exactly. in a not understanding that all these are casted. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 exactly. And I think that, so I really appreciate the, the education on that. And I think, but still, as you say, the, the point still kind of stands that, that his interpretation of it was, was for the internet because it was mis well, arguably misinterpreted. It was not the artist, how it was interpreted was not how the artist intended it to be interpreted. And so even if it was disruptive, it was a very different kind of disruption. And that's one of the biggest problems that I see with street art and graffiti and muralism today is that you have artists, and again, like I ran a mural program in Little Italy. I have contributed to this, and I have contributed with murals that I genuinely love. But there is a problem when artists fly into town, are given a wall, have two days to figure out, it, at best, what the hell I'm going to paint and get it done. So highly unlikely, that I don't, I don't know how long in this particular case Sever was in town for. Maybe he was here for the whole summer. I don't know. But there are definitely cases where an artist has flown into town and told, here's a wall, go paint, do your thing, and they got to pull out a page from their sketchbook and paint something and hope to God that the community likes it and doesn't offend everybody because maybe uh, you, know, you paint uh, my friend Roa, he paints animals. Maybe you paint a skunk. Oh, shit, what if like a skunk like attacked a little girl in that neighborhood last year and he doesn't know that? <laughs> like that could be a bad thing, but otherwise a Roa skunk is awesome, you know? So that's, that's a problem, that, that idea of not getting to know the community is a real problem, I think, in the sort of explosion of street art murals that's happened in the last few years, um, yeah. If you, if you understood the piece, it was a great piece. Right. right. I saw it when I went up, I was like, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> but then the backlash on that piece, I was like, oh, I totally did. You know, right. so I, just, yeah, I understood both sides of that. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's like the where, I, where my job is now, my day job, is at a community muralism organization. And it's the kind of murals, you know, we, there are degrees to what we do. Some of those murals, though, are like, let's paint a portrait of somebody in this community who no one outside of this street is going to know but to this community is a hero. And we're going to paint them, and everyone else who walks by is going to think that's a silly mural, but that community is going to love it. And some murals are like Steve Powers, uh, who's a great, great muralist, who 
uh, is from West Philadelphia, and he painted 40 murals in West Philadelphia that are essentially a love letter to West Philly. And um, he had to go to community meetings and hear people out and get input from the neighborhood. But at the end of the day, he did art his artistic vision. He went out and ran with it, and it's amazing. And but, but he still spent time, right? He spent time and got to know West Philly and said, what can I do within my artistic vision that they would like, rather than just flying into town and not knowing those things? Um, yeah? So at, at times, often, uh, this, this art gets very political. And it's, in general, quite biased from what the art, the street art that I know. Like, I don't see a lot of you know, physical or digital graffiti going after like read or Nancy Pelosi or anything. <laughs> so I, without like opening a can of worms, like, I know it's a much bigger question, but like in your own terms, could you consolidate a reason why like this, this whole society or like this demographic that they're going after tends to lean very heavily towards the left? Um, why, I, somebody, I, somebody in this room could answer this better than me. Why are artists left, left, uh, left wing, left leaning? Because I don't, I don't know that I'm, I bet you, I guarantee you studies have been done that can answer that question, and I don't know. But it's, but it's the same reason. They have, studies have been done? No? I thought somebody said yes. Um, no, I, it's the same reason that artists are left leaning, whatever that reason may be. I would argue that artists are left leaning because artists is a very broad definition, and people who, I mean, for the lack of a better example, paint um, mallards for postal stamps <laughs> tend to be somewhat more right-leaning. I'm, I'm just very yeah, yeah, yeah. um, it just, I, I think that it's just the nature of the street art itself and the methodology of the art is more appealing to the people who would initially be more left-leaning because the revolutionary methodology of the street art also parallels the uh, revolutionary rhetoric of the leftist progressive movement. And, 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 and that's that's a really good point. And there are also, you know, there are street artists out there and graffiti writers who are conservative, and there are street artists and graffiti writers who have no intentional. I mean, my girlfriend does some street art, and she is. And I love her to death, and I don't think it's a bad thing that her art is not political. You know. Um, so there are plenty of street artists out there like her who are not doing explicitly political work. Um, I mean, I know, I know street artists who are army veterans and who I, I know one who I'm almost positive is like a right w very right-wing guy, but he, uh, is, he's anti-drone and he was really pissed off uh, with like the drone attacks that were going on. So he made some street art that was like anti-drone. and. But I'm I'm pretty sure he's a conservative, so it does it, they do exist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Art's been political for centuries. You look at Goya, Vasquez, most recently you look at Guarnica, like Picasso. Mm -hmm. It's they're you're using a medium to be heard, and this is just a new generation of being heard <coughs> and speaking politics to a larger medium that you're not going to be able to affect the voters, you know, or you know, the electorate that's going to affect the voters and make them think. So this is a great medium. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so, um, but why only a great medium for lefties? <laughs> um, we uh, one, one more. Um, what about graffiti? Not so much um, having the motive to be disruptive on a broad scale, because um, there's also a coded language in graffiti that is very insider and very much for the people that understand. Oh, yeah. Which I would say goes back to that seven piece where. If you actually read the language of the way a K goes, or somebody writes their S, then you actually know what neighborhood they're from, um, who taught them, what their cruelest affiliation is, and things like that, which don't necessarily have to do with this, um, you know, this broad disruption. Oh yeah, um, you know, I mean, I, you're you're right, and like if I if I wanted to like give a talk. I, I, if, if the focus of the talk were different, I could have gone on about that for an hour, right? You know, I'm sure you and I could be up here talking about, you know, taking apart, you know, a chaos piece and figure out what, you know, why does that C look like that, right? Um, and that's, that's totally part of it. One of the interesting things, just to relate that back to the internet, I asked a lot of my friends who are writers who are, let's say, you know, between like 26 and 35, 
And they'll say they were the last generation to sort of grow up without being heavily, heavily influenced by the internet. So they still had, they had mentors, right? And they had people whose letters they were borrowing, right? But now, kids are going online and they're not, they don't know who Twist is. They don't know who the people in their neighborhood are who were writing 10, 20, 30 years ago. They just know that Revoke is awesome, but like, and that's great if you're in Detroit and you're like learning from Revoke, but if I'm based in Philly and I like take my letter style from Revoke, like that can get kind of dicey. It's like a, an LA writer, Revoke is an LA writer who's now based in Detroit. So, so there's a lack of mentorship and apprenticeship uh, that the internet has caused that, um, that makes that coded language, like we'll see, I think the next five or 10 years is gonna be really interesting to see um, what that looks like, you know. Um, but yeah, you're totally right. There is graffiti that is meant to only be read by graffiti writers. So you could say that that, that is a fantastic reason why my, my point is totally invalid. <laughs> and you're right. <laughs> uh, I don't know wh how we are on time or how long I'm supposed to go or should go. So am I supposed to, should I take more questions or do we have more questions? I guess not. Or no more questions? Okay. Uh, thanks, I think. Thanks, everybody.